So creative mornings, here we are. This is our second virtual. So Leanne did the first. I'm back co-hosting this one as Leanne gave birth last week. So yeah, quite a big deal. So round of applause to Leanne. And with that in mind, participation is encouraged, as I'm now realizing. It's incredibly strange. It's very silent coming back at you as you're talking and you're used to having people there. So Molly is going to be handling the chat. So if there's anything that you're enjoying or you want to say or just give a wave or generally join in, emojis, little messages in the chat would be great and Molly will be handling all of that. This month's global theme is nature. So why Doug is absolutely perfect. And you'll notice as well that I am in polytunnel world, which is my future dream. And this is an actual picture from Doug um, and his setup. And I'll change these a little bit as we're talking through so you can start to see, you can be immersed in the world of Doug and nature. Um, I have to mention the sponsors. So the biggies for global is MailChimp. Um, they have MailChimp Presents, which are, it's a really lovely series. Um, short films, podcasts, um, with the entrepreneur in mind, but very creative um, angle. WordPress. They've got some webinar -y, learny type things, as everyone seems to be doing at the moment. So if you want to add some more of, more of those to your list, they have some. Then we have Basecamp as the final uh, global one. And they're all about the re working remotely um, and how you uh, collaborate with your teams. So um, super relevant at the moment. There's loads of us. <laughs> For anyone who's new, um, we I think we were sit we were city about 150, 152, something like that. And since we joined, there's now 215. So it keeps on growing and sits around the world, which is great. Um, Creative Mornings are also doing a, a field trip. Um, so these I've got, they, they're now virtual events. So there is some benefits because normally we wouldn't be able to hop over to New York to get to all of these. Um, so now they're online and there's actually, yeah, there's some really, really nice ones in there. So again, they're free and just signing up. So uh, creativemornings.com forward slash field trips with an S. Um, Take a look. These are some that are coming up. So, hello, Sheffield. I'm in Liverpool, by the way. So, <laughs> um, so we have our local sponsors. We have Sheffield, Hallam University, the Institute of Arts, who've been amazing sponsors right from the beginning. And this year, we've been really, really pleased to um, have Site Gallery get on board, who are backing us up. So this is me back on the reins for just for this month. We have Molly, who's there in the chat with her cat. <laughs> we have Rich Wells, who has just been, yeah, we just call him a bit of the hero of the team. Um, I think most of you know him. We have Make It Matt Black, uh, who normally records these events when they're in real. Fantastic videography skills. Uh, Joe Horner doing the photography. We've got a new picture in for Joe this month. And Jack, who is a fantastic illustrator, he's been illustrating all of our speakers each month. Um, and so they get shared on our socials as well, so you'll be able to see those. And when we're in physical, he's there on hand helping in the days as well. But for the moment, we're relying on his illustration skills. So that leaves me to introduce Douglas, aka Regather. We're just going to do this as a, um, a conversation about Doug's journey. So we had a catch up a couple of weeks ago and um, yeah, it's great and plenty to tell. So I'll just, um, first of all, just ask if you could tell everyone a bit about your background. So it was, you know, we were talking about the journey mm -hmm. from London to Sheffield. Yeah. But how you started at uni and then stayed, which seems to be quite a common story. Mm -hmm. um, people get yeah fall in love with the city so do you want to just tell us a bit about that yeah so um i'm sure quite a lot of you might be familiar with this with this kind of uh, story trajectory um yeah i came to sheffield to go to university uh, but i grew up in london and it was quite <coughs> quite fun to you know 
move away from the from from the big city and go and see another part of the country. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, moved to Sheffield in two thousand and four. Um, and then when university, when I finished university in 2007, I was like, well, it's, it's, no, it's cheap here. I've got lots of friends. Let's just, let's just hang around. Let's just stay on for a bit. Um, so that was, that was great. Yeah. Stayed in sort of another three years of just, I don't know, like not really doing anything particularly, uh, exciting or interesting, but just like just sort of hanging out and getting, getting, getting into Sheffield. But then, uh, after a couple of years of that, lots of sort of friends of mine started like doing the sort of migration to London thing for jobs and whatever. And um, they were just sort of feeding back what a good time they were having and how fun it all was. And, um, you know, as a sort of quite, I was still quite a passionate Londoner and I felt a bit like, um, a bit like jealous because I was like, oh, it's kind of my city. What are all these, all these sort of other people are just, what are they doing? Who are, you know, they're going to London and they're having the best time. And I realised I hadn't really, you know, obviously I hadn't lived there as a, the sort of young adult, independent, I'd always been at my parents, obviously. Um, so that was one factor, in, in, in amongst some other things, like my partner went to do a master's at a university there, etc. And um, so I sort of got this urge, sudden urge to like go back. I was like, I've got to go back, I've got to sort of scratch the itch, as it were. Um, so I went back down to London, um, and yeah, had a, had, a, had a great time, great time there, and sort of jumped into a, a sort of career with a third sector, organization doing sort of community work environmental projects on sort of um or deprived communities in london and that was all good and started earning a bit more money and i was like oh this is quite fun you know you know this is rather than like working in shops or sort of just basic admin jobs in sheffield i was like yeah this is, this is good i'm getting getting into this london's great um and then after a while i was like right let's 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 go let's go on an adventure let's um you know loads of people go traveling don't they in gap years and all that I hadn't really done Hadn't really done that, so me and my partner decided to like head off. On you know, um, wasn't it in a van? Um, yeah. So, but, but, but what we decided to do was um, <laughs> uh, not not just go backpacking, basically, because we we we'd got quite you know got our careers sort of going quite well, and we didn't want to just like drop everything and leave without like I don't know building on building on what we what we'd sort of. Uh, what we'd, what we'd learned, what we what we'd got on with, basically. So we decided to buy a camper van um, because that meant that we could then go and do uh, like uh, volunteering on farms. Uh, it's called woofing. Some of you might be familiar with that term. It sounds a bit like dogging, so it's always a bit weird to explain it. What you do, but yeah, woof, woofing was the was the thing. So we were like, oh, we can go travelling. We can go around in the camper van. We're kind of into that anyway, and. Um, yeah, we can. We, 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 we're we're going to learn things in the, in the meantime, and not just not. It's not just like a one big holiday, basically. If you just explain woofing for people who don't know. Yes. That, okay. Yeah. So it's so you, you, you. Yeah, you basically you basically go and um, there's a whole directory uh, online of like little farms, basically small holdings, uh, other kinds of projects, but mainly mainly small holdings and little farms. And you go and stay. You go and stay with people. <clears throat> and they um they, they put you up and they feed you and you you volunteer your time like five six hours a day on their project um you know you get your weekends and stuff like that and yeah it's an interesting way to you know um to just to, to see the see a place basically what um, was the favorite woofing well yeah the, the two highlights were definitely um we we spent quite a lot of time in the uk initially um because we were like, well, you can go travelling all over the world, but why not? Let's let's go and explore explore the UK. Um, Very on theme at the moment. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we actually drove the van all the way up to the Outer Hebrides in Scotland, and then drove it all the way back down to Cornwall. Wow. Um, and there was a, there was a place in Cornwall that we 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 really we really liked, but and then we got a ferry over to France and drove around for a bit, not woofing, just like travelling in a camper van. And then after a few months of that, we ended up at a place in southern Spain. Uh, an olive farm and we spent three months there and that was a real highlight that was really that was really good you know um really like um really amazing landscape in the sierra nevada in southern spain um yeah so that was really that was really good but then we then we decided to come back and um we actually went back to our favorite place in cornwall in the winter um which is interesting lots of weather and um and that was probably the favorite place and we stayed we stayed there for like six more months um wow. so we, we weren't really traveling around we were just getting really embedded into into cornwall um anyway that that, that sort of lifestyle of uh, carried on for a, carried on for a bit um and um well then you kept, did you cook that was then when if 
that when you moved up to Sheffield again? Well, yeah. So then, but then, I, then I came. Then we came. Then we came back to London for a bit, and we were sort of <clears throat> staying at uh, my partner's parents' house, and we were sort of wondering, wondering what to do next. And um, we actually went off woofing another time again for a shorter time because we weren't really sure what to do. Um, I and... can't get talking out of my head. Now you've said I've never thought about that before. <laughs> now you've said sorry, it. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's, sometimes people react to it weirdly like that and they just look at me like because they get muddled up so yeah. but then, we um then we yeah then then we um in the in the time this is like nearly two years of sort of like vagabonding around in the van and yeah, in that right. time I felt London had really changed a lot and it and and given the lifestyle that we'd been living you know off-grid rural you know, uh, lots of lots of lots of lots of practical work outside you know like didn't feel like London offered me it wasn't the well, place I, like I wanted your, to then go back to I know? liked your anti-desk statement oh, like, I'm a big anti-desk person yeah exactly that when just going back a bit so when I was working in London I kept getting these little moments where I'd be working on a project and the people would turn up from like a city farm or somewhere yeah. and um you know and I would be set, trying to set up a community garden or something and I'd be sort of coordinating the project with the community and these other people would would turn up and do all the sort of practical stuff and I kept thinking that's actually what I want to do that's more that sounds more appealing I think that's better for me um so that was and that was obviously what part of our like you know the the, the journey as woofers as volunteers um but there yeah I just felt London didn't really um didn't match up with me anymore like who I was after our big journey and um, the obvious choice was to come back to Sheffield, where we still had loads of friends. And um, and I, you know, I, I I knew the city well, and I knew it's like you know green space, Peak District, the countryside. It's pace of life slower. Lots of the things I'm anyone living in Sheffield is um, to be familiar with. So yeah, it seemed like the natural thing to do to to come to come back. And that was about three three years ago. Uh, the other thing worth saying is. Um, Oh, I suppose I've gone to point two now, Penny. So, but you, well, the point two was bed boxes. <laughs> yeah. So, well, 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 that links a bit but into. I think system. that's where you're heading, anyway, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so um, one of the a lot of these little farms were places that ran a, a veg box delivery. So we'd kind of been working on that a little bit, and a friend of mine who worked for who worked for Regather at the time because it was set up long before I got involved. Um, he was sort of like, oh, look, we need a new delivery driver for um, the veg box run. Um, if you come back, I'm pretty sure I can get you in. You know, I can get you in on the um, get you in on, the, on that on that job and you can just do a bit part time. And that'll, that'll sort of uh, get you going when you move back to Sheffield. It was a bit of a, um, a deal breaker in a way. So I said, oh, yeah, that sounds good. You know, like, <laughs> I've just been driving my van around for nearly two years. You know, just carry on, basically. And um, you know, joined joined back into the VegBox team, doing two days delivery driving, um, two days a week delivery driving, basically. Um, and then I sort of, uh, I guess I just sort of made myself useful and stuck around. And uh, you know, well, uh, well, you just got more involved. So we were talking about it. So it was like you're landing back in Sheffield on the veg box. Mm. Um, and then three and a half years later, what that is now, and that yeah, well, the, the, building the other in... or growing the farm, and just how involved you've got from that level is well, well, yeah. And the other, and the other interesting little thing is, so after after a couple of months of me, you know, just I was just I was just delivery driver basically, and I and I was just sort of trying to find other work and other things yeah. to do. But um, after a couple of months, my colleagues were like, one of my my colleague Fran was like. Um, who, if any of you are VegBox customers, you might have emailed Fran. Um, she, she was like, oh, yeah, um, we th regather think they're going to try and uh, become vegetable growers and buy a farm. And I was like, hang on, this is like, this is, this is just what I've been doing. This is what I want to do. Yeah. This, is a, this is an interesting opportunity. Because, um, you know, for a while I thought, well, maybe I'll have to leave regather and find something that's more than two days a week. And I was like, oh, hang on, this, this, sounds, this sounds pretty cool. This is interesting. Having no idea about how you go and actually set, set up a farm or do anything like that. Um, so and um, we found ourselves like, I think one quite wet Saturday morning in November out in a field near Dronfield like just that was for sale like digging holes in the ground and like we're like what do you do like, what do you do when you're trying to buy a farm well we don't know let's just dig a hole and count work <laughs> so, uh, you know we, 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 were, we were doing that and we were like yeah this 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 might work it's a, it's a field you know it's quite close to Sheffield this, this will be good um, and then we went back to Riga and did some like research because there was this weird like 
environment agency sort of dam thing in the corner of the field and we were like oh that looks a bit weird what, what is that about went back and did some research and it was like a an environment agency you know flood scheme thing and like once in a hundred years they were entitled to like flood the land is a flood prevention mechanism so we were like all oh, right that is definitely not the right bit of land to, uh, to, to go ahead with but anyway that the point was that then like the the sort of um you know the spark had been sort of ignited in me I'd, i was like right these people want to try and start a farm i want to be a, a, a grower a veg a farm or whatever i want to do all this let's just let's just like let's just stick with this and get stuck in um so and yeah that then uh, that that was a, that was a journey of like making the veg box a bigger and better thing and at the same time trying to figure out how we became food producers in the background basically and so I think as well, I think of you, because we were saying as well about how you kind of handed over the veg box side of things, because you've, you've got quite involved as well during the lockdown period, because obviously that's... Yeah. So, I mean, we can't really at the moment we, um, avoid the, the, the topic of lockdown and obviously mm. how that's impacted um, yourself and the farm, because I know this week's been really busy for you. Yeah, well... well yeah we i'd sort of we'd been dealing talking with the people so the people who own the land that we're currently renting it's been a, a bit of a it's like a two two year journey so um to get that up and running but the whole time i was just working on the veg box you know because yeah. we weren't really in a position to like you know start start the farm so uh i i was just working on working on that more and more and more and then in in january this year we sort of you know I was like, we've got to make the plunge i've got to become full-time Full time. Um, I'm not really. I wouldn't. I never say farmer because in in the in the in the world of vegetable growing, you, you're called a grower. So uh, it's just a bit of terminology that I, <laughs> I quite like. But yeah. So so I didn't really. I had to become a grower. So I was like, right, January. I've got to take the plunge. This is the new season starting. I'm gonna you know do that. And um, you know that was all. That was all good. It was we were we were ready to like you know start getting all the things in place we needed, we needed to do. Um, and then obviously this the, the bloody pandemic happened and uh i had to like get redrafted back onto um you know the veg box and it took up loads of my time and you know obviously we had to like steady the ship and you know keep going and we had um you know we had a crazy amount of like interest because suddenly everyone wanted their food delivered um etc and um so we yeah we decided to really like scale that up you know and it was quite it was quite quite crazy actually we we almost in about 10 days we sort of doubled the number of customers um do you think do you get the feeling that more will stay as well once it's well yeah so what we what we actually had it was quite interesting really because we had to we had to like close off new customers because we you know we would have yeah. it would have just it would have kept going and we would have yeah. and, and we obviously couldn't manage that many so we've made a decision to stop having new customers but then inevitably we sort of call it customer churn you know you always get lots of new customers and then some leave and yeah. you just got to make sure that the joiners are more than the levers and then your business grows um and um so obviously after closing customers after a few weeks it started to sort of tail off again so then we had a we had a waiting list you know um like vulnerable people that had got in touch who we could prioritize etc because that's obviously the right thing to do at the moment um so yeah we've we, 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 we've opened that up and, and people are coming back and yeah i think there's still a lot of interest and it's still we're probably still going to see a lot of lot of growth of new customers basically which is great how many how many people have you had working on the veg boxes this journey? um now there's a bit so not everyone's full time but um there's um we've got Clem and Fran, who are like the sort of brains of the operation, and then there's packers and delivery drivers, basically. Yeah. So there's probably another. There's probably about ten to twelve, depending on depending on who's who's in and doing what at any one time. Yeah. And it used to just be me and Fran for a long time. Yeah, that's interesting because I know as well, like just stalking a bit on Instagram, and I've put mm. up now again the Politon, obsessed with Politon. Yeah. But I know you had some volunteers over helping, like doing this, doing the like social distance building of the polytunnels, and um, yeah, what's been you know what's been happening with that? So what developments have been able to continue at the, at the farm? Yeah. So yeah, so one of the one of the things um, when we agreed to sort of rent the land, the the people that own the land they needed they needed someone to set up the infrastructure of the site. So we need so we ended up like wearing two hats. We were like sort of site developer people putting in the infrastructure, and then um, also like you know becoming 
becoming vegetable growers. So we've been doing those things sort of concurrently and the roles kind of blurred over the time that we've developed our relationship with the, um, with our land, with our landowners. Um, and yeah, so the, the things I've been doing this spring is getting some storage put in place, like with a shipping container, had a borehole dug for irrigation, which is like my obsession currently, as I'm sure you can imagine with the dry weather, um, you know, um, a, 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 some, some hard standing so I can get a vehicle onto the site, um, uh, a trackway so I can have vehicles move like up and down the field. It's quite an interesting site because it's, it's quite steep and sloped and undulating, which is really nice in some respects, but it's not very good when it's, when it's wet because you can't get a vehicle around. Um, and like, um, I did actually do a little bit of veg growing there last summer as a sort of little test, like a little pilot sort of giant allotment, I kept calling it. Um, but um, I carried an awful lot of kale up quite a steep, muddy hill. Um, and it well, got, there's the got, walk for the morning. Yeah, yeah, it got, uh, um, and they got really tiring and really and quite boring actually after a while. Um, yeah. So, and obviously, actually, I, I'd had one of the big challenges we faced is I had plans to start all this stuff back in September. I was like, oh, this is good autumn work. When you're not having to grow vegetables, you can get all this stuff done, put the polytunnel up, etc. And then it just, on the 22nd of September, I remember the date because this is how serious it's been for me. It just rained, didn't it? And it did yeah. not stop raining. Yeah. And then it had about a week of like no rain and quite nice weather. And then we had, a, and then we had lockdown. So, <laughs> so that's been really, it's been, you know, it's been really for long trying to like manage the veg box growth, going back onto the veg box team, getting all the infrastructure sorted out you know starting to do the vegetable growing which is quite a quite a task in itself and under the whole shadow of this pandemic it's been pretty i think it's long. like it's really telling like the more you're working with nature it's really highlighting how much nature is changing at the moment like yeah really the change of the change of climate the change like even the you know even the pandemic is due to how our relationship with nature yeah um, i think that's that's quite telling of you know the, the, strug the struggles that you've had with this right now it's yeah just really hits home yeah uh, and, and nature and and it kind of feels like this is the new norm in a, in a way as well like you know the the extreme weathers are a bit more normal and yeah well well as far as i was just saying yesterday as far as i'm concerned i've just lived through a wet season and a dry season you know that's yeah. it's, that's literally been that stark um, and it's been really challenging yeah. And um, when we when we spoke a few weeks ago, Penny, it wasn't it was it was quite not, it was getting quite a nice spring. I think it might have even been an overcast day when we had a longer chat on the phone. Yeah. Uh, and um, so in the last couple of weeks, I've really felt like, blimey, if anyone doesn't feel like the the, the big climate changes are all like it's happened. It's, I don't think it's like something we're working towards. I think it's we're literally happening now. Yeah. It's been really it's been really tough. Though it's been, I spent yesterday. I don't know. Must have moved about two hundred liters of water by hand. <laughs> that's all i did yesterday afternoon it was really tough uh next week i've got loads of pipes coming which is exciting giant water lego um to put together um which would be which would be great but until then i've just you just got to water stuff there isn't really yeah. there isn't there isn't a you can't catch up and do that tomorrow you've just got to get it done and um it's, it's been really full on with this with this hot weather <clears throat> and it's been really it's really if i was like if this happens again and again which it probably will do yeah. then um yeah it's really it's going to be really challenging and producing food it's sort of it just all comes sort of crashing home really but it's yeah. also made me really interested in looking at like the resilience of the site like how do i make it more i was just going to say water. does it change what because what was your i mean bef uh, what was your original ambition of what to grow and um and then ha has that changed and how has it changed if if this is going to become more common do you have to change what you grow change what your ambitions were um the goals in terms of what in terms of the veg to grow um I, i'm not 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 sh not sure yet really i don't i don't i don't know definitely how i'd change that um it, it's you know a small scale vegetable growing is you, you do a massive variety because you know essentially some things are going to are gonna are gonna are not gonna do well one year and something's gonna do well another year yeah. you know a, a good year for squash might not be a good year for leeks for example because you know they're like quite different conditions at, at times um it's made me think more holistically about like about the about the site about having um we did a crowdfunder back in just before christmas called the sheffield hedge fund which i don't know if some of you might have been aware of I and like um it. 
which is quite a cool name we thought um and we just raised we raised some money from the community in sheffield people generously gave money to enable us to plant loads of hedgerows on the land but it's little things like that you know shade wind break you know water retention all these sort of what do they call them ecosystem services like a horrible term but like it's things like that you know like to make the site more resilient to changing climate rather than just a big bare field you know but i love how the community get involved um like that in sheffield particularly i feel it's really strong Mm. um because so then i guess we'll in which because we had a thing, I've got a note, and I can't quite remember. And if you can't either, we'll move on. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, there we had the quote of "out of the ashes." Yes. <laughs> well, it was just it was just like at the at the beginning, I suppose. Yeah, and maybe this is pers- personally as well. At the be- at the beginning of the of the pandemic, when the news really started, like you know, ramping up, um, and it was like, right, this is going to be. This is going to be quite. This is going to be quite serious, isn't it? Actually, you know, what does it mean for us as a business? We had we had quite a few like quite intense meetings, where we were we were sort of like, how do how do we as a small business just find a way through all this? At the same, and I was thinking, right, well, I'm trying to set a farm up. This is terrible timing, you know, um, and um, we just weren't really sure what what it meant, and um, obviously, what it, what it actually meant was that we we became really valuable to lots of people. Um, really really important you know because we can get food to food to people that needed it and um we were really busy and it gave us a real like sense of purpose and um you know we sort of all rallied really rallied together as a as a team yeah. and um you know like i said we doubled the customers in 10 days we just we, you know it's just um it was just unprecedented you'd never you'd never you'd never want your business to grow that fast in normal circumstances i think um, but we did some quite maverick things like you know on the veg box we we've got um regather was a quite an events collective once upon a time that's kind of where we started like doing uh like little festivals in sheffield and so we've got a lot of like festival kit big we've got a big marquee that's normally a bar you guys know the folk forest festival that's in sheffield that's that's us we um um yeah we so we we run that and um so we've got this we've got this stuff and it's the bar marquee and so um we just put it up outside the back of the building and we didn't really ask anyone (laughs) Uh, we didn't really ask the council if we could do it um and so that was a bit naughty really but you know it meant that we could it meant that we you know it was like a sort of like a hack you know how can we how can we make this how can we make this work how can we make make it happen so that we can keep doing the veg box to, to more people um and and it's so th- uh, we've we've changed it. The marquee's coming down next week. We've we've done some other mad things in our building to make the veg box thing tick over. But yeah, that was there was this there was this definitely the moment of a um, couple of weeks where I wasn't really sure what we were doing, and then we um, yeah we managed I to sort of survive really. <laughs> I think everyone had a bit that same feeling. Absolutely, yeah. So I guess then that brings us to the future. Yeah. And we had. Um, we had two points to that. So there was, what is the future? And what we're just talking about, about is this the new normal? I was talking with um, Helena who's on here this week and we we're talking about the effect that we can just see around. And when you really start to look and notice it, I mean, you notice it because you're working with it. Um, but I live, um, I live in West Yorkshire around where there's quite a few reservoirs. And the, uh, last year, even the year before, it, it got so low for the first time, you could see where they'd submerged it. So there was, there was the stone walls that had been mm. built. And no one had seen them in like 45 years. Mm. And there, I drove over here at the start of the lockdown, so nine weeks ago, they were already visible. Mm. And it was May. And before last year, the year before, it had been 45 years. And now it just very, very quickly, mm. that was a new normal. Um, so I just I think yeah definitely that the future of nature and how that you know kind of how how we work with that and also that you've drawn a map and a plan for yourself for the future which I really yes yeah, well. yeah, so, so yeah there's sort of two points like for the yeah. for the future is, is obviously i've got I've, i'm i've got a lot of plans you know for and i kind of touched on it earlier about how to develop the field and the, and the farm um and you know at the moment i'm just it's, it's a 15 acre field and i'm i'm using sort of a fifth of it i think um um to, to grow the veg so there's a lot of space but I'm, i've got a plan to like develop 
other farming enterprises on on the rest of the field um and i and i drew, and I, and I drew a map actually um and i did it maybe three years ago for a business plan that we had to write to submit to like access some loan finance and to you know that's how we're paying for the for all this stuff um and i didn't really know what i was doing because at all but it was really useful exercise because I, I drew this i drew this map and you know i did some research and i sort of got it all planned planned out and um i had a, a lot of it was to do with like sort of you know the sustainability which is um actually a term that i'm sort of trying to move away from because um i don't want it to be sustainable i want it to be regenerative that's the new hot word in sort of in sort of you know um sort of this kind of farming world it's regenerative you know like let's not sustain it let's 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 regenerate yeah, yeah, yeah. and there's there's quite, quite, quite a lot of discussion about that word at the moment yeah yeah so so it's, it's it was all to do with it, it, it wasn't just like divide it up into blocks and put what vegetable where it was like where do we put the hedges where do we put some ponds you know how do you make it how do you make it good for nature um i'm surrounded on one side by a semi-ancient woodland and then the other side of the field is surrounded by um the uh, nature reserve moss valley nature reserve so I've got really, it's really good boundaries, you know, for, for nature. And, and, I, and, I, and I see, there is a lot of nature on the field, you know. I and I think the people who you rent it from, they, they, um, I remember you saying that they're also quite um, into this. Yeah, yeah. so, so the, 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 the people that own the, own the field set up a social enterprise. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the field owners has, happens to own, the, own this woodland next door. Yeah. So it's, it's, all, it's all like this, um, you know we're looking at the lands we're looking at it as a whole landscape um really and and thinking about like you know the that landscape as a as a thing for the future not it's not just a food producing sort of um the soil isn't a medium that we're just going to put the veg in and grow it and sell it you know there's it's a bigger there's a sort of bigger picture there which is shared by us and the people we're renting from um so yeah that's so in terms of the the, the the future and what i did in terms of you know drawing a map drawing a map and making a plan it was all it was very much to to think about all that kind of stuff um and i've definitely i've always sort of got ideas for bits of the field where we're going to leave it wild or we're going to we're going to plant more trees in that bit you know the wet bits going to have willow trees because they like growing in the wet there's no point in trying to grow vegetables on a steep boggy bit of field you know let's turn it back to to nature and i think we'll see the benefits from that well, no, the, the trouble is, there's a there's an awful lot of nature, and they all want to eat my vegetables. So, um, <laughs> and that, that is there's uh, yeah. Um, you are literally feeding the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's some, yeah. I've had I've had some run-ins this week with pheasants, badgers, hare, and um, and some deer. So yeah, I've got to find oh, ways. Oh wow! <laughs> I mean, I know you talk about that as in a problem, but like, it sounds like idyllic. I know, like yeah. It's, it's, what you're watching is it Snow White when she's in the little cottage. <laughs> Licking a plates clean, which I always thought was a bit off, but yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. If, if you go, if I go early in the morning, I'm pretty much guaranteed to see a hare running about. The hare's running about. That's pretty. It's really cool. They're really cool animals. Um, but they, they, yeah, yeah, they do also. They like the lettuce. So yeah. And what do you? I mean, like, because I know we've talked about with the change of the weather and the climate, and it can seem quite gloom and gloom and it's a very real presence but I think there's also very positive things coming out of it I mean what you're doing mm. um, are there any other initiatives that um, uh, that you have seen or some some things that are happening some things that are changing on a, on a bigger scale as well yeah. There's some stuff that I'm aware of or stuff that we're doing or stuff that you're aware of as well. So I mean there's there's what you're doing as your part, but I mean this there's got to be more people doing this. I mean it has to get to be Yeah. Um, I wondered if there was well, uh, yeah, one one interesting one interest. I think I've actually the, the comments have been flicking up, flickering up, and I've had half an eye on them. And I saw George Monbiot's name mentioned, uh, and I think he was doing a talk maybe even yesterday for festival of debate um right. in, in sheffield and um he's definitely thrown his thrown his hat into the ring on some of these subjects and he was obviously a big proponent of this rewilding thing you know like yeah. I, I, i'm not sure i'm totally with him on on it in the way he frames it but anyway the overall discussion about you know like letting nature get on with some stuff and managing 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 parts of the landscape less and letting nature do its thing more is is really interesting and um 
on a bigger landscape scale that's 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 quite interesting but you don't we don't i don't think we really have much of that in in england but if you're in parts of scotland they're doing things like that much yeah. much more um you know, Wales much scale. Well, yeah exactly where well, there's uh, up, upland areas um stuff like that uh, so that's quite interesting and there's there's that, those people down uh, you might be some of you might be familiar with it if not definitely check it out it's called the nep estate k-n-e-p-p -P, the nep estate and it's down in sussex and um it's some, i think they're pretty wealthy uh, and they've got this huge estate and it was a farm and it wasn't really working and they just they just basically ab abandoned all management practice and just let nature do its thing and apparently they've got this really amazing new landscape with sort of cows sheep horses it's all stuff roaming around you know, it's, they're still farming the for, for the meat basically but okay. they um there's lots of other cool cool things happening down there they've got all these all these butterfly species have been flooding back and you know it's there's some really interesting designs and yeah and just also anecdotally just there is there's a lot of nature on the field there's i've seen loads of different birds i'm, I'm getting my bird song identification skills going up because i'm just there all the time yeah. lots of insects and small mammals there's you know this, it's definitely it, been hearing the birds. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. Just during this time, I'm just on the outskirts of Liverpool and, mm -hmm. and I'm walking my dog uh, a couple of times a day and the birds and the nature that we're seeing, there's geese and duck from a pond and they're really like venturing out. And for, I mean, we just didn't notice that stuff. Um, either we're too busy and doing whatever else or they're staying yeah. you know, more back because it's busy and there's people around in traffic. Yeah. and. Uh, playing all the rest all that all that other noise that's going on uh, you know, the one other interesting thing on the, on that point about uh, on a slightly bigger scale is there's a there's an event that i've been to twice but it's been going for over 10 years called the oxford real farming conference and it's right. a really cool event that happens in january um and it's like sort of all the sort of organic and slightly alternative farmers basically get together and have a have a big conference and you know have a bit of time to catch it. it's really it's really it's a really cool event there's loads of interesting speakers um pretty good pretty good um sort of session in the evening in the pubs and whatever but um it's not just about organic farming for example it's just it's kind of like just slightly alternative stuff and they and a couple of years ago they did have a guy with a really big you know we've got a 15 acre field it feels big when i'm walking around it but it's not big in the grand scheme yeah. of agriculture especially in the uk and this um a conventional farmer so someone that uses herbicides and pesticides to grow grow their grow their crops um um, and he he gave it he gave a talk about what he'd been doing and um you know and changes he was making to his farming practices sort of more nature friendly i suppose and the, the thing that the thing that did it for him which is what i thought was really interesting wasn't like loads of lobbying and other people saying you must farm it like that is he just bought a beehive for a hobby um you know because he was like oh you know keep i'll keep some bees i'll learn to be a beekeeper have my own honey and as soon as he had the beehive he looked at his pesticides that he was spraying on his crops in the field next door and was like I just it, it, it just he's like I can't it can't match up I can't do this I can't like how can I spray the pesticides there with my beehive there so you know um just that connection maybe yeah exactly so, so that, and that started him off on an interesting interesting sort of journey to like changing his farming practices to be more nature friendly I suppose yeah. so that was another and uh, you know, he's doing that and he's affecting hundreds of acres with those decisions yeah. and that was another interesting thing that and and the growing that you're doing then so you have the veg boxes yeah um what else where else would you be supplying that growing for so well, would you be doing the events or is it for people to buy wholesale or how, how? well i mean events events are events are completely off for the time being we've we've yeah. we've, we've cancelled all we used to do some events at our regather building in sharrow we'd have like little comedy film music nights stuff like that we've had to we've just postponed all that because it was so much uncertainty yeah um and you know focused our energies back on the veg box and equally summer events next summer we'll see what happens but yeah. you know we've 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 just sort of plunged into the into the into the food thing really for sheffield that's we've, we've focused on that now and when it um, when it does open up more, like it's kind of lessening, but mm. it's all very unsure still. But let's say next year. <laughs> mm. um, would you have, do, do you have a woofing system on your site? Do you have volunteer, you know, can people mm. volunteer at your... I've, I've currently got some volunteers who are helping me um, and they're, they're very much, because of the situation, it's sort of people who we already know, or I already know yeah. reasonably well. Um, and because I... And it, it, 
but when things do open up yeah i would like to be able to offer like you know more regular volunteer sessions where more people can come like say on a wednesday and it's sort of kind of open open yeah. for anyone to come and and participate um um small scale agriculture definitely needs the help uh, it's a bit of a sort of you know the elephant in the room really that you, you really rely on volunteer labor to help it make it work economically in some respects but, but if people want if people want to get the time as i said that comes and, back doesn't it like um it's quite difficult to get allotments not everyone has big garden spaces yeah. so sometimes something like that could just work perfect you know you have the social aspect as well as the yeah, there's inherent value in volunteering. You know, it shouldn't, yeah. it shouldn't, you shouldn't be too worried about like having that as an as an offer, um, basically. Um, so yeah, I'd love to have more people coming coming to the land. It's um, it's it's uh, like for example, Fridays are the day when I have I have four people come on a Friday, and it's quite good because we sort of sort of finish everything off, and it's a really nice atmosphere. And then we have a socially distant lunch together, and <laughs> it's, it's nice to be able to work to be able to work with other people. Um, because it, sometimes it's just a bit lonely on your own uh, up there, I suppose. Um, so yeah, having having, and I think people in the landscape is 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 important is important for me. Yeah, you know, that's people, yeah, that's very true. People. Um, and would you would you do shout outs on? Is it would you do it on the regather fact? Like where where should people follow for the farm? Uh, well, there's regather there's regather Doug, which is my Instagram handle. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, but there's also Regather Works. Um, so Regather Works is probably the best one to follow. Um, I think. <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's that's the best the best one to follow if you wanted to wanted to find out about um, our volunteering opportunities in the future. Um, but yeah. Um, well, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> It's the thing with being at home, we got the delivery and no one else is here, so um, yeah. yeah, sorry. <laughs> and you all could hear Pip, so she said hello. Um, well, shall we, shall we have a look at some of the chat? I'll see um, if there's some questions in there, because thank yeah. you so much, Doug, I think. Okay, yeah, have you haven't rambled on too much? Really great points in there. Um, let me see. Molly, are you all right to take over with the chat? Yeah. Um, so some people, I don't know your real names, I can only see your handle. So Cosmo Copy has asked for some practical tips on stopping caterpillars eating kale. Mm. For organic tips for that. How yes. The, shall, uh, shall I just do these one at one by one? Is that how we're going to? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So you've got, it's your cabbage white, your cabbage white butterfly, which are just emerging. I've seen some of them uh, and yeah they are they're laying their eggs on the on the cabbages and the caterpillars are hatching and like stripping the leaves bare um, the best thing the one of the best things to do is to cover the cabbages with with a fine you need a fine mesh you can get it in garden centers you need to keep them keep them covered um, and uh, you might need to put a, like a hoop uh, in place first like um, you can you can some people make them out of um, you put a bit of bamboo cane in the ground and then uh, a bit of sort of um, hose or piping over the top to make a hoop and then you drape your net over the top of that uh, at the field I do that but I don't bother with the hoops so much the cabbages are quite happy to you know push the net up but um, and also like I'd have too many hoops um, on this on that scale uh, so that's that's one way that's one way that's one way of keeping the cabbages off if you want to go get really like sort of organic and holistic about it um the other thing then is to actually like almost leave some of the kale sort of sacrificially but have had enough of a um interesting habitat for the predatory wasps that eat the caterpillars to be alive and as a living population and then you have this moment where at the beginning of the season the caterpillars emerge and start eating kale and you, everything goes horribly wrong and you think oh god but then the wasp population rebounds and it's like well there's loads of food and the wasp population explodes and they eat all the caterpillars but i think that's quite it might be quite difficult to do at a garden or you know, allotment scale actually but that is that is the that's what i want to build up to i want to i want to move away from not using the nets and having this like you know nice nature balance um but i think i've got to, i feel like i've got to earn that with all really good habitat you know where there were lots of places for all these insects to live basically but netting is the is the is the, is the quick and easy easy option well thank you and then both jamie and heidi have asked about regenerative farming which i think we sort of mentioned yeah. 
earlier and touched on and just sort of a bit more detail on if it's something you'd look at doing was it something that you're doing up at regather yeah so i it's it's quite a new term i think uh, in 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 the sort of like you know uh, alternative farming world should we say or the, or the farming world um and i think a lot it's a lot of it's too like with building soil um build, you know building building nature back up not just like this while i was saying the words you know to sustain something just means like you're keeping it at a certain level whereas regenerative is building it um and it's 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 thinking more 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 than like oh have i got vegetables in the ground are they healthy can i harvest them it's like what, have I, what else have i done what with my practices have i managed to build soil um uh, regenerative regenerative farming typically um people typically talk about the use of of um, a mixed farming system with livestock in there because livestock and grass and well-managed permanent grassland is a is, is one of the one of the best ways to build soil but obviously we're about to open up a can of worms about animals farming veganism etc you know there's a whole explosion topic there to go into but lots of people i know who are who call themselves or people i see online who i who call themselves practicing regenerative farming um yeah they've got animals in the system somewhere so um, in terms of me at Riga, that is something I'm considering, and I think chickens for eggs might be the first thing we do, but just not yet. I've got get a hand, get a hand on the vegetables first. <laughs> um, Nipkin Burley has asked uh, about schools and colleges, and is education the key to getting people interested in what you're doing, mm. interested in regenerative farming, or sort of what Riga is as a whole? Yeah, we um, we haven't we, we haven't typically done work like directly with schools and colleges like on the farm or the veg box at the moment. Uh, I suppose it's not it's not said that we we wouldn't do, but um, you know it's just we're kind of um, we've been really busy. It's been good, but we're also a small business and it's just really hard work keeping it going. So um, we tend to not try and focus outside of like the sort of core, um, you know, business side of. of, of of, of it for now um we've done quite a lot of work uh with the university of sheffield and some other universities and sort of rural research level stuff um universities are quite interested in us they think we're interesting cool i guess and they're always sort of sniffing around trying to get involved in a, in a research project or to get us involved with stuff which is great um it would be it would be yeah fantastic to have more you know more education about all this kind of stuff and um you know as we as things open up and the farm is a bit more uh should we say, it's still quite rough and rustic there but uh, but in the future it might be nice to have it have it where we can have school groups visiting etc and and you know that kind of stuff me personally i'm i'm not gonna be doing any like education work myself it's not it's not my not, not my thing necessarily yeah. personally but yeah like making, making a connection would be, the... would be interesting in the future Sounds like you've got enough on your hands with the hares and the deers and everything. We're going to get hold of revenge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 just saying the the visits thing. Generally speaking, like having people visit the farm and come and see. You know, obviously in a managed way. It's not. It's, we can't really have an open, necessarily an open, fully open gate for big groups of people to turn up. But like you know, it shouldn't be. I don't think that food production should be like hidden, closed, closed sort of thing. It'd be nice to have people to come and connect and see how it all works. Because yeah, you've definitely learned lots by seeing it. I think people touching the earth and connecting with it, I think it's that thing, is it, is it old David Atterbury? Like we can't save what we don't love or there's something yeah, there's that, like the more that we're aware of it and know it, like the, the example with the beak, the, you know, the farmer that gets the mm. beak and then once he sees it firsthand, what the yeah. damage being done. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, and even for, even myself, like just just seeing just how difficult it's been at the moment with without any rain, you know, um, that's it's, it's even even in the last few weeks, I've changed changed and sort of entrenched my position on this a bit more. I feel like. Yeah. Um, shall we just do? Is is there a couple more, Molly? There's just yeah. one more, and it's about sort of who else you work with and whether you're working with Moss Valley Market Gardeners. Okay. Um, yeah. Pickle pairs asked if they're your neighbours. Yes, yeah, so um, Moss Valley Market Gardeners, Martin Bradshaw, he uh, he is a, a grower on a site that's more commonly known as Sheffield Organic Growers, and there are four different businesses all operating on, on the Sheffield Organic Growers site. 
Moss Valley Market Gardeners is one of them, the site splits for, and they are two fields away and I see them all the time. I'm always over there borrowing stuff, asking the questions, you know, whether they like it or not, they've become my sort of unofficial men mentors. <laughs> um, and uh, I did a bit of volunteering there actually to sort of get myself going on this. Um, and I, I volunteered with Martin first. He, he offered me like, yeah, he said, oh, look, you're going to start doing vegetable growing. It's a pretty bonkers journey. Why don't you come and <laughs> learn something from me? Um, and that's actually a really nice um, thing about the Moss Valley where we are is that there are five now five small organic farms all within you know all within two fields distance from each other. So we're making a little it's a little a little hub a little a little a little a little food sort of story in the Moss Valley um, south of Sheffield. So there's there's a little thing building up there, including our neighbours who are actually conventional farmers. Moss Valley Fine Meats you might be familiar with anyone. Um, and there's another guy that just grows grain who's our who's our who's our immediate farming neighbor and obviously we're on different trajectories they're doing like this sort of com uh, conventional industrial food thing and we're doing the small scale organic veg thing but we're all neighbors as a as a we're all we're all connected and we're all we all sort of get on and help each other out so there's a little there's like a little food community at the end of this lane just south of sheffield which is really nice it just puts my faith back into humanity <laughs> and that, you know there's enough of us to do this right as well at the moment. And I think you're leading the way, Doug, with what you're doing there. I think it's super. Mm. And I'd like to say thank you so much for your time this morning. I know this week's been great. I kept getting messages like, irrigation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's crazy, yeah, it's been really crazy. <clears throat> I mean, I, I am, and I think these are really real problems. We say always first world problems, but I think these are really real problems. Yeah. And I think you're doing an amazing job. And I hope to come and volunteer at one point when we can all gather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, get, get, if people can get in touch with me, and we'll see. I'm, I've got, a, I've got a massive list of people who have expressed an interest. But if anyone else wants, you know, just stick your name down. When things get contact? sorry, I just spoke over. Well, well um, I mean, the best thing really is my email address. Um, I'll just stick it in the comments now. That's just the, that's the best thing for for this kind of stuff. That would be brilliant. Um. Because you can email the regather shared inbox, but I don't check that anymore because I'm too busy on the farm. You know? <laughs> you know, if you come direct to direct direct to me, and you know, maybe it's if you there, it's there in chat, Douglas Kemp at regather dot net, yeah. direct to source. There, yeah. but, but if you have a look at the um the other, it's I think it doesn't uh, regather work. That's Instagram, obviously, and Facebook as well. Um, and there's me regather Doug is also on Instagram, but I think I might be sort of transitioning more of the content over to our, um, uh, you know, the Regather Works handle on Instagram, but there's some, there's some stuff on there as well. Well, I'd just like to say thank you so much. And uh, from the comments as well, it looks like a lot of people have got a lot out of this this morning. We've had a really okay, yeah. good show. It's, um, yeah, credit to you, Doug. We've had a really good show of people this morning. And um, yeah, let's give everyone, a, give him a wave. <laughs> Do we do, do one, that? Try and like, do one back. <laughs> oh, right. Then I'm going to finish it off there. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for your patience with my delivering and my dodgy breakout rooms. And um, I look forward to seeing everyone on the other side. Back to Leanne okay. next week. And um, yeah, thanks for having me, everyone. <laughs>